So thank you for coming. My name's Jonathan White. I'm a, I'm a surgeon. I should, um, I should declare something at the start of this talk. This is not a typical TED Med talk. Um, I won't be talking about how we transform health. I won't be mentioning about how we scan the brain. I won't even be saying the, the word DNA at all. I'll be talking about something a bit more straightforward and a bit more simple. I suppose maybe it's, it's a talk about something that I did, which I thought was a simple thing, was turned into something a bit more complicated and perhaps something that turned out to be something a bit more wonderful than I had expected. And it kind of changed, uh, may not change the world, but it certainly changed my world. So as I say, I'm a, um, a simple surgeon. Uh, this is a picture of me in the Royal Alexandra Hospital, operating room number two. And this is the actual OR, right? That's my actual headlight and my actual mask and my actual gown. That's the actual bed where the actual patient's going to come in in a few minutes. We took this picture in between cases. And if you come and find me on a Monday or a Thursday, I'm here treating people with bowel cancer and different sorts of things in uh, uh, general surgery. Um, and uh, it takes a long time to become a surgeon. I started in medical school in 1987. And I finished and got my job here in Canada 2006, so that's almost 20 years worth of training. There's a lot of stuff that you have to, to learn, not just how to operate and how to do the procedures, but, but kind of when to operate and when not to operate. It takes a long time to train somebody who's going to essentially attack you with a knife whenever you're asleep. Um, and part of, the, 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 part of that, that effect on me, I suppose, is that I have an enormous interest now in, in education. I'm very interested in what happened to me turn me from a, from a novice into a, an expert, because apparently I'm an expert now. Um, so I, I'm very interested in surgical education and how we train the next generation of surgeons. The other thing I'm interested in is, is uh, technology. Um, like I'm the first person I know who had an email address or a website or a blog or a, or a wiki. Um, and I've tried 3D printing and I've tried Arduino and all that stuff in the maker movement. And I'm not very interested in the hardware. I'm more interested in the software. Specifically, I'm interested in how we use that software to communicate with one another how we send stories back and forth, how we look at how, we're, how we've changed the way we do movies and the way we do books and stuff. So I'm interested in surgery, I'm interested in education, I'm interested in stories as well. Um, this is how I learned surgery, however. This is a picture of me from probably 1987, 1988, I would suspect. And uh, uh, any students who are watching this will find this very strange. There are no electronic devices in this picture and I'm studying medicine. There's no laptop, there's no iPod, there's no phone. I'm not texting anybody. I have no earphones in. I am sitting at a table. This is my parents' dining room table. I have these odd things called textbooks, and I'm taking notes from them. And that thing in front of me is an actual human skull. That's a person that I was learning the anatomy of the skull from. And that's how I learned surgery. And I thought, with this interest that I developed in, in education and technology, I wonder, could we use technology to change the way that we teach people about surgery? I thought, can I combine surgery with some form of technology like uh, the iPod, uh, which was the, all, the, all the rage in 2007, 2008, was still fairly new at that point, to make something new and different. And so we decided to make some podcasts and we decided to keep it really, really simple. Um, we decided to stick to what we knew, some very basic topics, um, like the bread and butter of surgery, stuff that every doctor should know about, about surgery. We decided to keep it really short as well. So each episode we would make would be maybe 12 or 15 minutes. And we decided to make it just audio. So no pictures of operations, no videos of operations, just really simple, short stuff. And because it was so simple, like surgery for beginners, we decided to call it surgery 101. Like not surgery 201 or 501 or 601, nothing advanced, nothing complicated. Um, very basic surgery 101. Um, I remember one of my colleagues actually said, because at that point we had 125 students in the class, and the, and the school has grown quite a bit since then, but one of my colleagues said, why don't you burn 125 CDs with these episodes, you have these audio recordings, uh, or why don't you get 125 USB sticks, put them on um, those and hand them out to the students as they come through. And we decided not to go that way because we were lazy. Uh, like who's got the time to burn 125 CDs? Who wants to buy 125 USB sticks? We used this new technology called iTunes. And we took our audio recordings and we stuck them on iTunes. And we made a little title, Surgery 101, and some text. And the list of, uh, of, of episodes is up there. And it, they run between, I, I did the introductory episode, and then one of the residents who was working with me, Parveen Bura, did, um, together we did the scripts and he did the recording. And uh, we told our students about it. We said, we have this thing that you might like to use and let us know if you think it's useful or not. Um, it's on iTunes, just search for Surgery 101, give them the link to iTunes. 
and uh, that was about it. We did a little study and showed that they were using it and they seemed to like it. Um, one of the key things that we did, and we didn't realize how important this was at the start, um, the key thing was that our students already pay tuition, so we thought we can't really charge them for this. So we decided to make it completely free, zero dollars and zero cents. And we also didn't quite know what to do with the copyright thing, so we made it Creative Commons open source. So we said, you can take this and play with it and make more podcasts if you want, kind of release it into the, into the world. And that was about it. Those are our 10 original episodes. And it is our 100th anniversary as a medical school. Those conditions would be familiar to any surgeon of 100 years ago. Like, those aren't cutting edge things. We're not talking islet cell transplantation or heart transplants or LVADs. We're talking about appendicitis and breast cancer and colon cancer and hernias. So we gave them to our students, and we promptly forgot about it. Uh, unlike the elephant, we forgot about it, and we moved on to more interesting stuff. Like my resident moved on to become a chief resident and is now in practice. I moved on to some other stuff as well. And that was it. We forgot. And then something else unusual happened. And this is where the kind of strange part of the story starts. Because so far so good. We made some stuff. Students seem to like it. Move on. Um, what happened next changed certain aspects of my life. And it changed certain ways that I think about education in general. I kind of regard what happened next, for me anyway, as kind of a life-changing moment. Um, so here are those 10 episodes we put out, get them to our students. Um, and when you put a podcast on iTunes, you're required to provide a contact email, so Apple can email you from time to time. Um, and we started getting emails. I got an email from a guy who said, uh, this is, these, are, these are great, when are you making more? Uh, we got another email from somebody who said, I like your episode on appendicitis, but I want one on pancreatitis, please. Can you make me one on this particular topic? We got requests. And we got people who were in other countries. Like I got an email from Germany and Brazil and Romania, people saying, we like Surgery 101, when are you making more? And bear in mind, we didn't tell anybody about this. It wasn't like we went out of our way and said, hey, there's this amazing thing, you should use it. These people found this on, on iTunes by themselves and then came back to the source and said, make some more. Um, so we had we'd found we had an audience um, and, and they had some demands and we thought maybe we should do something about this. So I went back to my colleagues in the Department of Surgery, and I said, there's certain episodes that I can do, because I'm an expert in certain things, but I don't know much about brain surgery or heart surgery or the different things. So can you do me an episode on heart transplantation? Can you do me an episode on coma? And we got such a large number of surgeons who wanted to be involved with this that we ended up having enough material for an episode every single week. So now we put on an episode every single Friday. And we've got a number of episodes in the can, and we just keep running every, every single week. And it turned out the surgeons were doing what's called elaboration of, of an existing teaching script. Like if you sit Max Findlay, who's one of our neurosurgeons, down and ask him to talk to a medical student about coma, he can do that in two seconds flat. He, just, he doesn't even have to think about it. it. It just comes out of him the way that he would normally teach a student. The way that we're doing it with Surgery 101, instead of teaching one student at a time, he can, he can now teach a thousand students at a time all around the world. The other key element in kind of expanding Surgery 101 was these guys, who are the Surgery 101 superstars, which is basically our mobile podcasting team. So there's Katrina on the left-hand side, and then Tracy, and then I'm in the middle, and then there's Jenny and Shannon on the, on the right-hand side. And they became our mobile podcasting team. So when a surgeon said, I want to do an episode on heart transplantation, they would go to his or her office, they would sit down, help that person develop a very simple script with a beginning, a middle, and an end then do the recording for them, then take it back to the office and do the editing, and then we would upload it later on. So they did a lot of the work behind this. The other unglamorous part of this is that much of the work for this was done in this place, which is my messy basement office. So there's our microphone and our pop filter, and I would do the start of each episode, say welcome to, to another episode of Surgery 101 and the end as well. So that's, that's kind of the process of how the episodes got, got made. And here's what a podcast looks like. We use um, some software called GarageBand. You see there's a number of tracks um, in GarageBand. There's the top track where the speaker is speaking, that's their voice, and we, we chop their, their, their track up, and we, we take out the ums and ahs, and when their cell phone and their pager goes off, we get rid of all that stuff until it, it's just good stuff. We break it up into sections uh, according to their script, and then we punctuate those sections with music and sounds. So we play different sorts of music, we play drums, we play guitar sometimes, all within the software. Or occasionally we'll add in sound effects, like for the prostate episode we put in sounds of water running and toilets flushing. Um, and we'd also use um, a little bit of humour and tell some jokes sometimes. One of the key things we would do would be to tell stories about actual patients. 
like say, I saw a patient uh, with this condition last week and here's why it's, uh, here's why it's um, important. We also structured it according to very basic educational principles. So each podcast had a beginning where we said, here's what we're going to tell you. Um, then it had a middle where we actually told you what we were going to tell you. And then it had the end and it had the, where we summarized and said, so this is all the stuff that we told you. Same structure you'd find in an old Presbyterian sermon. Same structure you find in a radio show. Very basic educational principles with repetition and parsing and breaking up in chapters. Um, so two years later, we now have 120 episodes and we have lots of different types of, uh, of uh, content covered now, uh, kind of uh, almost from all different uh, avenues of surgery. We've also found we've been able to do series of episodes. So we've got eight episodes on the principles of cancer surgery, including a couple of episodes with patients who have had real cancer operations talking about their experiences. We've had seven episodes, series of seven episodes on, on inflammatory bile disease with a gastroenterologist doing the first few talking about the medical treatment and then me talking about the, the last few talking about the surgical treatment. We've been able to kind of go off the page here a little bit and talk about different sorts of things like what's changing in surgical education and disruptive innovation. I even did a, um, an episode called The Surgeon's Tale where I talked about how I got to be here, like how I came from Northern Ireland and how I en ended up in Canada. Um, and we've had a, quite a lot of downloads. We were delighted when we got our first 10,000 downloads. It's just, just amazing. Like 10,000 people around the world have downloaded this and listened to it and think it, mu it must be okay. And then we got 100,000 downloads. And that was enough to get us on the front cover of the local paper here, the Edmonton Journal, with my big face smiling out below the fold. Um, and we thought that was good. We thought that was maybe the end of it. I looked last night. We've got about 860,000 downloads at the moment. We're projecting about a million for, for Christmas. Um, we get about between, I guess, uh, an average of maybe 750 or 1,000 downloads a day. We've had several downloads since, we, since I've been talking here already. Um, you'll notice there's this little arrow shows uh, what happens when you screw it up. Like our, our provider switched off access to some of our early episodes um, uh, on, on this date. And there was a, a, an outcry. We got all number of emails from students saying, I'm studying for my exam tomorrow. I need this episode. Please put it back up. Or, or teachers saying, I'm referring students to your episode about dizziness and I can't get it. And you're making me look, look like an idiot. I go to the lecture and I say, surgery 101 dizziness. And they say, it, it's gone. So we had to turn it back on before there was a, a riot. Um, where are they listening? So um, this is our map of all over the world where people are listening. And darker color means more downloads. So obviously lots of people in Canada. It's an English language podcast. So Canada, the US, Australia, and Europe. But pretty much every other country is represented there. So 850K in about 150 countries. If you're listening, we don't have any listeners in North Korea yet. We don't have any listeners in Greenland. And Central and Southern Africa are underrepresented. I think there's one country in South America we haven't, uh, we haven't come to yet. Um, and this is with a marketing budget of nothing. Zero dollars, zero cents. We haven't actually tried to push this out anywhere. And I think this is the, for me, this is, this is the, the, the why moment. Like more people have, it seems that more people have heard me say, welcome to Surgery 101, than I will ever meet in my actual life. And I, my voice has been in more countries now than I'll ever visit in my actual life. It's just, it's astonishing the kind of numbers we're talking about. Um, this is who's listening. So about two thirds of our listeners are medical students, but we have slices there for residents and for doctors in practice as well. And that little tiny slice of the pie at the top, that is patients. Patients are listening as well. And we've actually got stories about patients coming to see surgeons and asking them about operations. And the patient says, you don't need to explain the operation to me. I heard you on surgery one one already. Like I looked you up, I found your episode on gallbladder surgery and I've listened to you explaining it already. So you don't need to do it again for me. Um, the other thing is that uh, it seems that about 90 or 95% or of our listeners think that we're either pretty good or uh, really great. And we've had about 100 of our episodes peer reviewed and published on a site called MedEd Portal. So I think we're, we're doing a fairly good job. We have got a, a website now, surgery101.org. We've also got an, an app for the, for the iPhone as well. We're on Twitter and Facebook. We're trying to keep up with the, with the young people, you know. Um, so what's the secret of our success? Um, essentially, uh, we kept it really simple and we kept it short. Um, we made it frequent and we made it free. Um, like it's one thing to talk about making a podcast every single week. It's another thing to actually do that, to keep up with the schedule. Making it free was very, very important. I had somebody who said, well, if you charge a dollar per podcast, you'd be a millionaire by now almost. 
And I don't think that would have been right. Number one, I don't need the money. But number two, I'm pretty sure if we'd charged for it, people wouldn't have downloaded it. And it's more important to get it, get it out there. It is high quality stuff. It's experts talking about what they know. And it's produced, we think, in a fairly high quality way. We use things like music, stories, story, and humor to get people talking and, and thinking about things so that they would listen, so that they would learn. We have been able to break down barriers between surgeons and patients, I think, between students and surgeons, and between people in, in, uh, in different countries. I've got stories about people listening. I've got a, a, somebody who went to a fellowship overseas and heard me talking on, on the computer and found their medical students listening, listening to Surgery 101. And we're actually taking expertise that's here at our medical school and spreading it out around the, around the world. So how can this be applied elsewhere? It's really not rocket science. It's old-fashioned technology. But it, it is very disruptive. Anyone can get it. Um, you can listen to it anywhere at any time, which is very different from the way that I learned medicine with textbooks and fairly arcane things and restricted to the, the high priesthood of medicine. Anybody can listen to this. Um, it works on low tech. It works on your phone. You don't need a hyperspeed broadband inter information superhighway. It works on your phone and it technically works on dial-up as well. If you just download the episode, you can listen to it later on. Um, and the distribution system through iTunes is, is the key here, really, the fact that it can be spread out all, all across the world. And I think making it free is the key. I think we should take our expertise and give it away free so that somebody here can do a podcast tonight on some complicated surgical thing, and somebody in the middle of Africa can be, li can be listening to it tomorrow and hearing updated, updated information for free. Um, what are we going to do next? Well, first thing is we're going to have to keep going. Um, we're going to have more episodes by patients and more episodes by students. We're developing something called the Surgery 101 Network, where we're getting students to submit episodes um, from their own countries to Surgery 101. And um, Surgery 101 Network is about getting episode requests as well. So we're getting re requests for new episodes. We've also got some summer students working with, with summer, uh, this summer on something called Surgery 101 Studios, where we're going to make more videos. Um, we're going to add some assessment items as well. We're going to build up some, some virtual patient cases. Um, so I think Surgery 101 demonstrates that you can take sound educational principles and simple technology and really change some of the ways that medical education is delivered worldwide. And if you, if you ask me where do I think this will go next, I would say um, this guy back in 1987 wouldn't recognize what's happened now. Um, we're studying, we're learning, we're, we're, we're online technology has changed the way we're learning in, in a way that makes it almost unrecognizable. And my prediction is that uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. So thank you very much for your time.